Hey guys and girls, my name's Dan, welcome back to The Forge. In this episode of Trust Me I'm a Blacksmith, I'm going to be talking about the death of the blacksmith. I'm a blacksmith. So, um, I put this video uh, out to vote. Um, you guys voted uh, to see the death of a blacksmith video. Uh, I'm a little bit behind on videos, uh, I'm moving house. Uh, and it's taking up more time than I would like and also there's some internet problems uh, but they're getting sorted so uh, hence my lack of videos at the minute uh, so I apologise but this video, the death of the blacksmith or um, what I'm actually going to probably end up talking more about is forging or the process of forging now the blacksmiths are sort of like dinosaurs they didn't kind of completely all die out just quite a lot of them did. Um, but through evolution and evolving and changing and, you know, survival of the fittest and all this nonsense, we still are surrounded by cold-blooded creatures. We've got crocodiles and there's still prehistoric sharks in the sea. And if what is going to become probably the more common knowledge, uh, that dinosaurs probably turned into birds, or a majority of them did at least. Anyway, those big ones stomping around killing each other, uh, they probably, you know, they're gone. But what we are left in with is change, the survival and change of those that have done well. And the big meteor or the, the rising sea levels or temperatures or whatever it was, or ice age or whatever they say the dinosaurs were killed by, kind of happened to the blacksmith. Obviously there was no meteor, but there was the Industrial Revolution and two, two world wars. And by the end of the Second World War, what was known as a blacksmith had quite clearly changed. And your common garden blacksmith, I'm calling it a common garden blacksmith as a joke, but the blacksmith that you would find up the fork in a road, who would fix your pots and pans, shoe your horse, and maybe even fix the cart you were riding on, didn't exist anymore. During the Industrial Revolution, blacksmiths made themselves extinct by producing larger and better pieces of equipment and turning themselves from blacksmiths into engineers, and then from engineers to machinists and all these specialist guys. So today we see the rise of the 3D printer. Back in the uh, Industrial Revolution, the using of coke, the development of blast, uh, the Bessemer converter, uh, the building of steam engines, the requirement for really large factory floor shops which would employ lots of people, bring them in, skill them up and get them making large machines that might do other jobs and that's kind of caught on. So nowadays it's not it's not you know it's not unusual for a workshop to have a drill press. It's not unusual for a workshop to have a small lathe. It's not unusual for a workshop to have a mill. It's not unusual for a workshop to have a grinder. Um, tools that blacksmiths might not have had back in the day. Uh, your common common old blacksmith banging away in his workshop might not have had a pillar drill, um, especially if you go back quite some distance. Now, some shops were very mechanicalized. Um, some shops were by the water and they would use water power to run hammers, trip hammers, and all sorts of things like that. Um, I'll see if I can find a nice video. Um, there's gonna be lots of links in this video. Uh, there's a nice video of some American blacksmiths uh, making um, axes and because he could earn more money pushing a broom in the city. I think they were kind of closing the workshop because he could earn more money pushing a broom than he could making axes because the process of hand forging axes in a water powered workshop is, was becoming redundant uh, because of industry. And this is the thing that truly made blacksmithing extinct. Not that people didn't want metal work, not that uh, blacksmiths were rubbish and they couldn't compete, it's because industry turned up and made things cheap and available and also it made jobs for you know anyone who could press a button or anyone who can stand in front of a thing load a hot piece of metal in bam out comes a forged product now that's what's changed and that change happened basically from the start of the industrial revolution all the way through to the end of the uh, second world war where it's commonplace now and this is what brings me to the death of blacksmithing. Uh, things like forging in fire and um, uh, Alex Steele and uh, Chandler Dixon um, and 
you know, all the all the TV programs you may have seen about blacksmithing that talk about how the history or um, you know these ideas of competition by making knives. They are all keeping our community alive and well, but it's changed. Our community is almost 100% changed from what a blacksmith used to be to what a blacksmith is today. And there's nothing wrong with that because that's what happens. Things change. Now, that brings me on to the subject of forging. Now, forging for me is probably, you know, blacksmithing is a very European, or oh, sorry, not a European term, it's a very English way of calling someone who works with metal a blacksmith. So, okay, in the UK, uh, a blacksmith might be a welder fabricator who welds and fabricates gates and railings together. In my opinion, he's not a blacksmith, uh, but that sometimes is used as the term for a blacksmith. I worked for a guy who was like that, who just used to forge a taper on the end and then scroll stuff up, but then weld the gates and railings all together. There's nothing wrong with that as well. I don't have a problem with that, but he would class himself as a blacksmith as I would class myself a blacksmith. Uh, I think in Europe uh, and Australia and other places in the world, I don't think that co is colloquially okay to call yourself a blacksmith if you do that. Um, but I know in the States as well, I think people do that out in the States as well, they consider themselves a blacksmith even though they're not traditionally. So the word blacksmith is what I have, um, I have a problem with because I don't think forging is dead. Forging is alive and well and it's really, really, really flourishing. In fact, uh, I know in 2015, this is when I did the research, in 2015, $14 billion of forged components came out of the United States. That's just the United States, Russia, China, Europe. I don't have the figures for those, but I can guarantee they were making lots of forged components as well. So if forging is still very popular, but blacksmiths are dead, why are we still forging? And this is the real reason for this video, because forging is epic. Forging gives you, the, gives you three advantages over any other process. It can be extremely fast, it can be incredibly cheap if you know what you're doing, and it also improves the quality of your material. So for certain aspects, you know, if it's quicker and it improves the quality of your material, the cost is irrelevant. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. So, speed. There are factories making balls, like round balls, to go on the end of your gates and railings, and they've got ball rolling machines, or ball bearing factories, They've got these machines that roll balls and they basically nip square bits of bar off, they crush them in these ball rolling machines and they become ball bearings or, um, uh, or they become the finials for the end of a railing. They are forged parts. Another example of forged components could be um, crankshafts. So very complicated components that need to be forged go into very complicated moulds or dies as they're called. They bang out the shape and then they'll go through a few processes of shaping and then they'll go end up getting, uh, then they end up getting slightly machined at the end after they've been formed and then sent away to uh, the car manufacturers to be assembled into cars. So if you're having to machine and, gr machine and grind all of those components, that could take a lot longer than forging the parts. So I know uh, you see some of these parts, the bar gets hot, it goes into the thing, it gets stamped out, it goes into a final stamp, uh, it goes into a final die or a finishing die, it then comes out of that and gets stripped, it then goes away and it gets twisted and then it might get forged maybe slightly again to make sure everything's in the right place and then it goes and gets heat treated or whatever and then it goes off and get ground. That, that is a lot quicker than loading a billet into a machine, machining it yeah. all and then sending it away for heat treating and then coming back. Now there's another reason that they might forge a crankshaft and that is for the improved qualities. Forging at speed, so we're talking one or two, one or two heats, maybe three, maybe four is probably at its limit. Forging does something to the material that only happens when you hit hot steel really, really hard, or you roll it in a press, or um, you put it into a ball rolling machine, or something like that. The steel is compressed and the grain structure is improved. The density of the steel goes up slightly, it doesn't go up very much, but it does increase. Uh, it improves the grain structure as well. It lines up um, what is kind of like a hash shaped, like um, when I talked about grain structure before, it's kind of referred to sometimes as wood. That's not true because the grain structure runs this way and it runs along the length as well. So you sort of get like a hash 
uh, like a hash mark uh, grain structure. Um, but by forging, that pushes all of those lovely grains into all the nice places, and then through heat treating, normalizing processes, that grain is allowed to settle real, really nicely into those areas. Uh, it's not only is it, um, the, the structure itself has been made denser, but it's improved the qualities. So the crankshaft, for example, has a very wiggly, wobbly shape, and by passing the grain structure through nicely so that the, it matches that shape, it improves the toughness of that material so it can work harder. Example, Formula One racing cars, when they were allowed to dispose of their engines really quickly, weren't using forged crankshafts, they were using um, they were using billet machine crankshafts, but now their engines have to last probably six months. They're not allowed to do that anymore, so they put crankshafts in them that have been forged. So that's, that's one example. I also worked for a, um, a guy, or uh, spent some time with a blacksmith called Roger Lund. He makes components that are forged because customers desire improved grain quality, so that when they make the parts, they, uh, they get machined and finalised, they go in, they can work harder and longer. I have been approached by customers, engineering customers, who also want improved grain structure forging. So, for example, a small component that used to be welded onto the end of a cylinder, they buy these from China at the minute, uh, or is it Italy? It's one of the two, China and Italy are like massive forging countries. Um, but basically, they buy these small components, they get welded onto the end of a cylinder, uh, if they billet machined it or cast, the parts would bend, but because they're forged, the grain structure is strong enough to withstand the heat from the welding process and the part doesn't bend. Um, another example is the same company, they approached me about making hydraulic, ra uh, hydraulic rod uh, that goes inside a ram for a table that used to shape material to separate large rocks from small rocks. That rod used to be the eye was made, the rod was made, they were joined together and welded together, they were snapping within hours of going on the machine and then the, what they did is they the rod they then put, uh, sorry the eye they then put a um, a little, uh, they put a little um, screw fitting that would screw inside the rod then welded it, they also snapped, now the result was they were making billet machined components from one piece, so they were starting with a very large piece of material, they were machining the whole rod uh, with the eye on, and they were snapping. Uh, they've now, I think they've found a company that's gonna do it for them, um, uh, I'm not quite sure, but basically, they are now having those rods forged. The difference between the welded, the uh, billet machined, and the forged. The welded rods um, were snapping within hours, the, the billet machined rods were snapping within days, the forged rods, I haven't heard anything back from them about the forging. I'm assuming they're going with the forging process. I know the guy kind of well. We haven't spoken about it for a while, but there's been, you know, that's the process they've chosen because the improved quality of the grain structure and then the machining process meant that the rods were lasting a lot longer. There are two other examples, and I put some links down below to these videos because I think they're very interesting. Golf clubs. There's a video in there about golf clubs. There's a metallurgic engineer that talks about grain structure and flow grain structure. Go and check that video out. Um, there's a difference of quality and feeling between a product where uh, you're hitting something um, with a forged product and you get different kind of vibration back through the, through the club than you do with a cast uh, head of like an iron golf club. Um, and they were saying like the, the, the reasons for the casting was that you could get more complex shape. The reason for the forging is you get this different feel, this different quality. And finally, shovels. There's a big difference between a forged shovel and a non-forged uh, shovel, a fabricated shovel. Forged shovels are so much better than cheapy fabricated shovels. Forged shovels cost more money. Uh, there will be some links to some videos down below. And they also talk about the improved quality that you get through forging. Um, so basically, is the blacksmith dead? Well, maybe the name blacksmith's dead, but is forging dead? No, and forging will not die for a long time. Things like titanium is forged, um, and titanium is forged in process. Um, steel is forged, you can forge aluminium, and that improves the quality of the material as well. So is forging dead? Um, no. Is blacksmithing dead? At the minute, I'm not gonna say it is because of the recession, the, the, the resurgence of backyard blacksmiths, um, 
DIY blacksmiths who are starting up as a hobby and then you know becoming you know making a bit of money out of it. You've got your guys like Alex Steele. You've got your guys like Chandler Dixon. You've got people like me, the college farriers. Yeah, I don't think blacksmithing is dead. I just think it's different than it used to be. Um, one thing I would like to say though, but you've got for, between like the end of the 1940s to about the 1970s, and there is a period where it could have all gone really wrong. It could have all disappeared because blacksmithing was in that sort of time not doing so great. But 70s onwards, it starts picking up and getting exciting. And there's lots of exciting blacksmiths out there um, that you should go and find out about. Uh, but that is the end of this video. Uh, a little bit of a talky one. I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, it, I, 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 think, I think that when people say, oh, blacksmithing's dead, really winds me up. I don't like it when people say that um, because forging isn't dead. And the Industrial Revolution was quite a time of like big forging. And I think we've got that still in our heads that that's what blacksmiths used to be. They did big blokes forging big chains and boats and doing all this stuff. And then, you know, I think we romanticize it ever so slightly, but that's just my opinion. What do you think? Do you think I'm wrong? So what did you think for voting for the video? I think that was a great idea. It was great to have a bit of interaction with you guys. I will put one up one a month. Uh, for a vote and hopefully you guys like it. Um, but that is everything for this video. Uh, check your comments down below um, and let me know what you thought. And that's about it. So thank you for joining me. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, to remember to leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already. And if you are already a subscriber, please ring that bell for notifications because that tells you every time I make a video and I try and make videos as often as possible, as long as I have it in there and I'm not moving house. Um, <laughs> I always seem to have problems getting videos out. Anyway, enough of my boring rubbish um thank you for joining me i will leave um a video up here for something uh i'll random round video there another random round video there caution they're live and i may have had a few beers uh this is my patreon and this is a way to subscribe thank you guys see you later goodbye